Good evening, everyone. Tonight I'm recording a vlog focusing on one particular topic, and this has to do with an anniversary that we just passed, which was the two year anniversary of the ChatGPT explosion. ChatGPT 3.5 came out two years ago and suddenly just blew up the world. Everyone got very excited about talking about it, doing things with it. AI suddenly became the dominant theme for a lot of conversation. And tonight what I'd like to do is reflect on these past two years and bring us up to speed. Now, I'm doing this because I, I've read a bunch of two-year anniversary or ChatGPT birthday stories and they very much disappointed me. They were uh, often either uh, too skeptical or too negative or mostly just too narrow. So what I'd like to do is just give you a sense of what, I, what I've been seeing. And uh, I'm doing this again in vlog format. I'm not going to add any videos or images. I just want to riff on this. And uh, I'll probably follow up with a longer piece uh, on my Substack. So just really quickly, a few key notes. One of them is that OpenAI's ChatGPT really, really dominates the field. There are other players in the generative AI space, uh, some giant ones, Meta, Google, Microsoft, for example. And of course, Microsoft has a relationship with OpenAI. There's a lot of Chinese research and development going on. There's a bunch of startups and, of course, a lot of open source work. But really, ChatGPT seems to be in the lead, uh, often having the highest quality services and also just getting a lot of user numbers and a lot of mind share as far as we can tell. Now, what people have been doing with generative AI, and th this is tricky, this is very tricky. Uh, we don't have good evidence, good research on this, and there are a lot of reasons. One is the subject is huge. We're talking about roughly tens of millions of users, perhaps hundreds of millions. So that's a large number to survey. The second problem is that we have the self-reporting problem. So, and this is not a new thing. This has occurred in other fields. Like if you ask people about their medical history, including drug use, you ask people about their sexuality, you ask people about their politics, and they have a lot of incentives to lie or to make stuff up, <laughs> if you will, or to not say certain things. And I think this is true with uh, generative AI. We have uh, oh, quite a few cases where people might view it as a subversive tool, a, uh, an illicit tool, and would not want to say that they use it. And there's also the reverse, where people who don't use the technology want to seem cool or with it or current or technologically sophisticated, and so they're incentivized to say yes, even if they aren't. Uh, I, I think the best thing for us to do would be something like you know, a really close analysis of a diverse population um, with uh, very, very close tracking of behavior, and, and that's not happening right now. Instead, we're dealing with self-reporting and a lot of qualitative impressionistic anecdote driven stuff so that's a big way of saying we don't really know um, we, we're on solid ground we try to figure out what we know about people using generative AI but what I've seen from the research I've seen uh, it seems like there are a few uses that we know of one is just making stuff so you know generating text of all kinds generating code generating images generating audio now video is coming up uh, swiftly so far most of that's under the radar but we're starting to see that come up as well so making stuff is big uh, a second usage is conversations and, and that can be uh, in all kinds of formats uh, one of the things that intrigues me, as some of you know, is uh, generative AI as a companion, that is, as a therapist, as a friend, as a lover, as a brainstormer, as a Socratic discussant, um, and, and that's, that's a very important function, and, and I don't think that's quite as fully appreciated. Uh, third field, and this is really not appreciated, and perhaps not widely used enough, uh, is the idea of uh, ChatGPT as, and other tools as a simulation engine. Uh, that is, we use it to simulate all kinds of events. So, for example, uh, I just, as a demonstration uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, asked ChatGPT to simulate uh, a lunar expedition from the Earth's surface and uh, to do so in great detail. So it was a kind of a science simulation. And as we were doing this, it was giving me choices of things like orbital trajectory and, and the, where my crew would do what things. And um, it, it was too nice and not risky enough, so I, I tweaked it to be more challenging, and it was. Um, I've written about this before, but I think that simulation function is incredibly powerful, and we need to pay a lot of attention to it. Uh, now, all of this is happening 
I was speaking of this in terms of the chatbot function, and that's of course the leading one, but it's important to that that multimodal input is now a thing. Uh, people are able to upload images of all kinds of ways. My most recent Substack gave a, a quick example of that. Now, this, all these uses represent a few changes. They represent, for me, one of the big ones, which is the change um, in our information searching and production environment, where we've moved from a kind of document indexing and retrieval mode to a generation mode. That is, if I'm looking for recipes or if I'm looking for books, I can Google or use other search engines or uh, other search tools embedded in other platforms like Amazon or TikTok and so on. But I can just basically look for documents. So the documents might be web pages, PDFs, uh, images, um, movie clips, audio clips, and so on. Uh, and that's what we're used to. We have several hundred years of training on that. Um, what's different now is generative AI is generative, so that it, it does go off and try to find stuff. But the important thing is it creates stuff on the fly. So if I ask it for book recommendations, it's making it up as we go. If I'm asking for recipes, it generates them from scratch. That's a subtle difference, but an important one. Now, there are two fields of uh, AI use I wanted to touch on really, really quickly. Uh, one is the medical field. Um, now, in the the medical professions, from what I can tell, have been extremely careful uh, with generative AI. They have a whole series of regulations, lots of internal practices and guidelines, so they're being very, very careful uh, in using it. But there's some interesting side effects. Uh, we've seen a few studies where uh, either uh, instru professionals using generative AI have done a bit better or generative AI has been better performing certain tasks. One that really interests me is how humans, at least in one test, found interacting with generative AI to be more empathetic, more productive, and more comfortable than interacting with human professionals. Uh, so we might see that interesting uh, turn start to happen. Now, also beyond the medical field itself, we might see more and more people uh, who are not professionals, but just would be uh, patients, using generative AI instead of Google. Uh, so famously in the medical field, people refer to Dr. Google, that is someone uh, you know, feels sick, so they type in uh, symptoms into Google search and they find all kinds of interesting responses and they then show up at a clinic or an urgent care or an emergency room and you know they are terrified that they now have you know some kind of enormous disaster uh, afflicting them now in a second domain that is especially crucial to me in my work is the domain of education and I have a lot to say about this and I, I just quickly want to sum up right now uh, as far as I can tell in higher education, most colleges and universities do not have a strategic response to generative AI. Um, they either have no policy at all about it, or they have a very small uh, addition to their anti-cheating policy, basically saying, and don't cheat with generative AI. Um, in most cases, I've seen that uh, universities and colleges are basically punting on the decision and giving it over to individual academic departments and units, which are in turn often devolving that to individual practitioners. So in the United States, where the largest proportion of our faculty are adjuncts, it may be that adjuncts are really driving our pedagogical use of uh, generative AI. Um, there are some exceptions. Uh, Arizona State University, uh, University of Michigan, my alma mater, have been doing some interesting uh, strategic work, including sandboxing, but most of the time we, we haven't seen that. Um, there, I haven't experienced a lot of enthusiasm for generative AI. I mean, I've seen some of that in classic early adopter populations, people who are really accustomed to using new technologies, but I haven't seen a lot of that in the ground. I have seen a lot of resistance, um, just act, people actively say, no, I'm not going to use this. No, my campus shouldn't use this. Uh, I had a friend say that campus IT should block access to generative AI right now. Uh, and then I've seen just a lot of curiosity. Uh, it's not enthusiasm, but a sense of, well, how do I change my class? You know, how, what are my students doing with it? What happens to my assessment and that kind of thing? Uh, again, the data problem I mentioned before is really lacking here. What I'm hoping is that more colleges and universities will do internal studies of their population, how their students are using this, as well as how their faculty and staff are. Uh, my, my open question that really haunts me on this subject 
is for the past two years, we've had generative AI at play in American higher education. Uh, I haven't seen it effectively blocked anywhere. Are we experiencing uh, a degradation or a decline in the value of our degrees if students, if a number, a sufficient number of students are either cheating with generative AI to get their degree or are using AI in a way which reduces their learning? I can speak to that question later on, but I want to pause there. There are other, other aspects to this complicated, fast-moving field that I want to touch on. Uh, one is that two years ago, when ChatGPT 3.5 took off, there was a huge boom in hype, and and that really that wave shot through the world. I mean, we had national governments, we had advertisers, we had um, all kinds of discussions about generative AI. And I think that hype has been overvalued in a lot of ways. I think there is a lot of genuine curiosity and interest in uh, a novel technology that had a lot of interesting features to it, but. Along with that hype came a big, big economic boom. Uh, as I've written before, billions and billions of dollars plowed into generative AI, which is often an expensive tool to uh, produce and develop. There's a lot of investment, um, but we haven't really seen an active business model uh, appear. Um, my good friend Brent Anders says, well, there is a kind of business model. That is, we're seeing some of the big companies like Microsoft and Google um, expand their um, their stock market value and their overall valuation is growing. But I'm not seeing that actually, I'm not seeing a direct business uh, role there. That is, I, I don't think there are people who are signing up for uh, Microsoft Word, who would never have used it before, but now there's you know, generative AI built in, they will. Uh, OpenAI seems to just be losing money at an epic scale. Um, so without that business model, this is where investors are now, I think, starting to crack the whip and trying to figure out, all right, how can we monetize this effectively? We are seeing businesses putting AI in services all over the place. So Google has infused uh, Google Apps with all kinds of generative AI, something similar in Microsoft, both with its uh, desktop office as well as its online office. LinkedIn, now there are stories of, I, mean, I, I experience this when I use LinkedIn, which I do frequently, and I'm seeing lots of generative AI help uh, in writing almost everything, and apparently there are a lot of posts now coming from LinkedIn that are using generative AI. I'm seeing this in other tools as well, uh, MailChimp, for example. Um, so that seems to be a, a major way that people encounter uh, generative AI, not through the applications themselves, going to Perplexity or Claude, not necessarily downloading uh, Llama, but they're actually running into it in the tools they use in their daily lives. Now, in opposition to the hype, Right away, two years ago, started what I refer to as counter hype or a wave of criticism. And now, two years later, that resistance is extremely well established, uh, both intellectually and in terms of numbers, from what I can tell. And it might outlast the hype. So we've seen this in a few ways. We've seen uh, legal action, a whole series of lawsuits, and I, I can't say this enough. It would be very easy for a judge in any of these cases to turn to, say, open the eye and say, stop operations right now while we settle this, uh, because they can make a pretty plausible case. I'm not a lawyer here. I know a bit of legal history and theory, but they can make a plausible case that all these tools are committing massive amounts of copyright infringement. Uh, we're also seeing public attitudes change. Uh, people are generally skeptical. Uh, there's not a lot of love enthusiasm. There's nothing like the love of Apple products, for example, you know, luxury goods like that. Instead, we're seeing a lot of skepticism and, and fear, which is you know, pretty grounded right now. Uh, we're definitely seeing scholarship uh, against generative AI. Uh, we're seeing this in scholarly papers and scholarly books, but we're also seeing it in public scholarship and public attitudes, people being interviewed, people using social media, and so on. I think I think the counter hype ties into other aspects of today's culture and their politics. Uh, for example, one thing I've been fascinated by is the rise of the tech bro as a kind of stock villain. We're seeing that in Hollywood more and more often, in pop culture, people starting ah, that's a tech bro thing, and that links up to generative AI pretty neatly, especially when you have prominent male figures uh, associated with it, like Sam Altman at OpenAI. Uh, there's also a, a pretty 
I think established and coherent uh, progressive opposition to AI along lines of progressive politics, namely along the lines of identity, so identifying bias in terms of gender and race, in terms of economic exploitation, and so that may take the form of calling out uh, these uh, companies for paying substandard wages to people to uh, who have to survey content in order to weed out undesirable content or can refer to the uh, part I mentioned before of copyright infringement. There's also climate change because we know that uh, generative AI uses a tremendous amount of electricity so that's drawing you know, more and more power which means they have to build more uh, power generators and also environmental concerns. Uh, the, the primary one here being the use of fresh water for cooling. Uh, so I think a lot of the resistance here plugs nicely into progressive um, opposition and progressive politics. Now, on a bipartisan level, there is a great deal of fear uh, about job loss and, to a lesser extent, uh, job degradation. That is, uh, people's jobs will become uh, less rich, less useful, less thoughtful, less interesting uh, if they work this way, uh, if we keep seeing uh, generative AI being used. So will that remove the uh, exciting parts of a job and, uh, and, and the creative parts and leave us with uh, the uncreative parts? So I, I, think, I think that's a, a a general concern. I mean, it's a, it's a historic concern. Uh, as, as old as the Industrial Revolution, when they really invent something new, be it the television or the railroad or the desktop computer, there's always the fear of unemployment, and often that fear is realized to some degree. Um, now, on top of all, I'm speaking about software here entirely, but I do want to conclude on a note of hardware, uh, which is we're starting to see some integration of generative AI into physical devices. So. There's been a spate of these as kind of jewelry or personal clothing items, none of which have really succeeded yet. Uh, they've been using generative AI in uh, cars, uh, which there's a you know, long tradition of computation built into automobiles. And we're also seeing generative AI being put into other devices and other robots. Um, just, to, just to wrap this up, it's, it's been an incredibly interesting two years. Uh, one of those two years which feels like a decade on fast forward for a lot of reasons but in, in particular for today I just want to refer to generative AI there's a, a lot more going on I haven't spoken about the future but I, I do want to pause right now or stop right now uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments uh, I think this has been an exhilarating two years a very rich two years and the richness of it the complexity of it is something that we have to take very seriously well, um, greetings from the 1st of December, uh, 2024. I hope everybody's well. Greetings from uh, one of the cats here, and I uh, look forward to hearing your responses.